Well, good morning, church. May I add my welcome to the one from earlier. My name is David. I'm one of the pastors here at Ocean View, and it is my privilege to get to share with you this morning on this penultimate week of our summer series, Smoothie Life. If you've not been with us yet, we have been taking a deep dive into the fruit of the Spirit, and we've been using that core verse from Galatians 5, chapter 22. Many of you have it memorized by now. You can say it with me as we go through it. It is, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And I have spoken to so many of you over the last couple months who have just felt like this is such a timely series for us in the life of ourselves and in the life of this church. Because what we understand is that when we embody the fruit of the Spirit, we are more recognizable as a follower of Jesus. If we want people to know if, that we have been set apart, that we are trying to be holy as God is holy, this is what it looks like. And that it is only possible when we are connected to Jesus, who is the true vine. Because his roots, his source, are in the Father. And that this isn't a pick, a pick and mix. I don't get to choose which one of these I like and just leave the others to the side and decide, yeah, that's not for me. No, these all work in harmony and in concert with one another. And so this morning, we're talking about gentleness. And I'm just going to be really upfront with you right from the beginning. As a man, as a male, this one was a little hard. Because we don't particularly like the idea of being gentle, do we men? I mean, we feel like God designed us to conquer our worlds. We are hunter-gatherers, right? If, if life gets hard, you pull up your bootstraps. If your kid falls off your bike, rub some dirt on it, right? Gentleness it feels somehow like it makes me soft as a man. Because the world equates it with weakness. I mean, meekness is a synonym for gentleness, and we've all heard that phrase, right? Meekness is weakness. However, as we look at Galatians chapter 5, we realize, men, that's not really an option for us. Because gentleness finds its source in the character of God. And if I really want to be a man, I want to look like Jesus. And again, gentleness works in concert with the rest of the fruit of the Spirit. In order for me to love you in a way that God would ask me to love you, I might need to be gentle. In, in order for me to show kindness to you in a way that would be a God-sized kindness, it may require gentleness. And in order for me to be gentle with you, it may require self-control. But I'm going to let Pastor Aaron talk about that next week. What I found as I began to prepare for this message this morning is that really gentleness shows its true worth, its true colors in those moments of friction between us and others. See, gentleness is absolutely fundamental to our relationships. But more specifically, when our relationships come under pressure. Sometimes it's a relationship that maybe is always contentious. And other times it might even be between you and a spouse. And at those moments of high stress or high anxiety, when friction appears, this is when gentleness is most needed for you and I. Another way of looking at it is this. Have you ever said something that the moment you said it, you wished you could take it back? Like the moment it fell out of your mouth, you were trying to reel it back like a fish on a hook. Because you knew you spoke in a moment of haste. You spoke when your emotions overwhelmed you. And it was going to cause harm or damage to the other person or at least the relationship between you and that person. That's really what we're talking about with gentleness this morning. Now, the word that the Bible uses in, in, for, to describe gentleness all throughout the book is prouse. Prouse. Now, the Bible uses it actually for two things, gentleness and humility. And that's not by accident. God is telling us that these two ideas are linked. In order for me to be gentle, it demands humility on my part. Because the greatest obstacle to gentleness in my life is pride. 
It's pride. And so God did this on purpose in his word to link these two ideas with us together. Now you need to know that the Greeks used the word praus in reference to a wild stallion, this magnificent, powerful animal that has been tamed and bridled. Because only once it is bridled is that amazing strength and power useful for the purposes of the master. And so it is for you and me. God has given you power through the Holy Spirit living inside you, but it is only useful when brought under his control and used for gentleness. Now, is the wild stallion any more powerful than the tamed? No, but the tamed is more useful. So if you try to sum up gentleness in just three words, and I think some of you may have heard this phrase before, it would be simply this, strength under control. Strength under control. That at the heart of things is what gentleness is. Now strength, we see that show up in a variety of different ways. Maybe the most obvious is there's a physical strength. Many of us have, at some point, if you've got little kids in your life, have said, gentle, be careful, gentle, especially if you've had a new baby in the house, maybe a puppy or a kitten. In my family's case, it's my 15-year-old son Joshua and his sister Sienna, who is seven. They are more alike than they care to admit. And periodically they begin to horseplay, and invariably it ends up in tears. And so every time it starts to begin, Kelly and I are ad nauseum saying, Joshua, be gentle. Joshua, be careful with your sister. Now, why do we only say that to Joshua and not to Sienna? Because Joshua's the one with the strength. He's the one with the power to cause injury. Therefore, the command to be gentle is for the strong, not for the weak. Sienna can't harm Joshua, but Joshua can do a world of hurt to Sienna. So physical strength under control is maybe one of the most obvious. Another is sometimes we have the power to, over someone's emotions because maybe that's been given to us. So there's an emotional strength. Um, many of us at some point in our lives found ourselves in a relationship where we realized, you know what? This isn't going where I thought it was going to go. This isn't where I want to remain. They haven't done anything to hurt or harm us. It's not a moral or an ethical decision. We just realized that I don't... I don't want to remain in this relationship anymore. And we have the power to either stay there and fake it, which isn't helping either one of us, or we can let them down gently. And that's when you say, you know, it's not you, it's me. Which, by the way, that never works. We see right through that. But it shows a sense at least of gentleness, of trying to let someone down carefully. Another position of power is many of you are in leadership in some area of your life because you have a certain set of skills, a certain set of experiences. And so you might manage others. And, and so for lack of a better way of putting this, you have almost a mental strength because of your understanding of a certain area of expertise. And any good leader leans in to somebody that they're managing and says, hey, you're doing a really great job here. I see what you're doing here. And you encourage them in the things that are strong. But at the same time, you then lean in and say, but let me offer you a few suggestions on how maybe we can shore up this area. We're not quite hitting the mark here. And so gentleness is a way of coming alongside somebody who's maybe not getting it fully right, but we do it without breaking their spirit. So gentleness. Gentleness is strength under control. Now I want to try to define gentleness really quickly, even, even a little bit further. And so if we try to string it out and have a little bit better grasp of what it looks like to be gentle, it is having great power and yet choosing to use it in a compassionate way for the good of others. So whether that's physical, emotional, mental, we have great power, but we choose to use it not for me, not even for the ends that I wish to achieve, but for the good of others. Now, if you remember from the beginning of our series, we talked about smoothie life being a lifestyle. Much like fitness, you can't dip in and out and expect any results. And so it is with the Christian life. The fruit of the Spirit is not just for Sundays and maybe Wednesday nights. It's an everyday occurrence. Now, when that happens... Gentleness becomes a disposition, it becomes a way of life that is even-tempered, tranquil, 
unpretentious and has its passions under control. This is what strength under control looks like. It is a choice and then it becomes a part of who we are. It becomes a part of our being. And so as we consider gentleness and what that looks like, and we understand that it's a choice, now I want to look at some of the ideas that cause friction in our relationships. There are causations that we can start to look for and can start to understand that are coming our way. And so what are those things? What are the things that cause friction in our relationships where suddenly gentleness might become necessary? And the first one I bring to the table, it's insecurity. If I feel insecure, if I don't feel up to the challenge, maybe I don't feel like I know enough. Maybe I don't feel like I have the tools I need to succeed. Maybe I've been put into a position that I just don't know that I'm right for. My insecurities start to well up. And when you're insecurity, what do you start to do? You start to try to justify your presence there, don't you? So we start to talk more. I might even raise my voice. I might even start to argue because I'm trying to prove to you that I'm worthy. Really, I'm trying to prove it to myself. But because you're there, you become the subject of my insecurity. That's usually how it goes in relationships. Sometimes it's not even external circumstances. Maybe it's just my fault because I didn't prepare. People ask me all the time when I sing on the platform, they say, do you ever get nervous anymore? And my response is always the same. No, as long as I'm prepared. If I've done the work then I don't feel insecure. But when I haven't done the work, it rises up. And then I start to talk to try to justify to myself and everybody else that I need to be here. And remember what the Bible tells us. <laughs> Where there are many words, sin is not absent. And so sometimes I'm the causation of the problem between me and others. But sometimes it's someone else. Sometimes they're have you ever met in your life that person who is just dead set to be against you? It, it doesn't matter what you say. It doesn't matter what you do. What, if you say the sky is blue, they're like, nope, the sky is orange. You're wrong. Some people are just determined to oppose you. And so sometimes you've got this aggressive opposition from another person. And it seems irrational. And we don't know how to respond. And there are a few ways we can respond. One, we can run in fear. And we can just shrivel up and say, ah, I, I don't know how to respond to this. I don't like conflict. Or we can fight fire with fire and we can come right back at them. Which, again, neither are gentleness. If we run away in fear, it doesn't help us. We don't grow. They don't grow. It does not advance the situation. But if I fight fire with fire, I'm also not embodying Christ to this individual. So how do we, how do we counteract this negative tension between us and them? Well, for many of us, this is obvious because our parents told us this from when we were knee high. If you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. We can make a choice just not to respond. Sometimes the gentlest thing we can do is to just walk away and diffuse the situation. Sometimes it's understanding that not everything is a battleground, not everything is a competition or a race. And if we can just acknowledge that no one necessarily has to win or lose here, Sometimes that helps, but our pride gets inflamed in these negative confrontations. And so sometimes we make it between us and them. But the bottom line is, we always want to err on the side of truth. Because sometimes we can't walk away. Maybe this is something that happens within our profession. This tension has to be resolved. And so we always want to err on the side of truth. But how we get there is through the fruit of gentleness. And Proverbs tells us how we are to approach someone who is combatively aggressive against us. And it's very simply this. A gentle answer turns away wrath. But a harsh word stirs up anger. So you can either be a peacemaker or you can be a pot stirrer. But it's a choice. Gentleness is a choice. 
There's a phrase that I heard a long time ago that has served me very well, and it really speaks powerfully to me that I hope it resonates with you, which is simply this. You can be right, but wrong at the top of your voice. I'm going to say that again. You can be right. You may have the right facts. You may have the right perspective, the right point of view. You may have the moral high ground. But the moment you lose your cool, you've lost your argument. You're wrong. You and your spouse may be wrestling over a major decision for you and your family. But the moment you lose your cool with your spouse, you're wrong. You may have the moral high ground as you hold your children accountable and discipline them. But the moment you start attacking and shouting them down, you're wrong. As Christian followers, as people who are apprentices to the master, we are to embody gentleness. Now, very closely related to this kind of aggressive opposition is just simply people who correct us in general. Um, correction's hard, right? We, we never like to hear particularly unwarranted advice. Because, again, my pride gets in the way, particularly if I'm being confronted in an area where I feel like I've got some element of expertise. And even if it's meant in a kind way and it's delivered in a positive, constructive atmosphere, it still kind of stings, doesn't it? Because you kind of hoped you got it right the first time. I always bring uh, my messages and my devotions to my wife. Because I always want to run it by another person, and she is my confidant, she is my trusted partner, and somehow I always want Kelly to read it. And of course, I want Kelly to go, oh, it's fantastic, it's clear, I understand it, it's concise. That never happens. I have never gotten away with that. And even though I'm coming to her for help, it still stings every time she's like, I don't think you need to talk about that. And I'm like, but it's so good. She's like, it didn't do anything for me. It's so hard, right? But it's also so incredibly valuable. And a gentle response to criticism is simply at least giving myself the time and the space to honestly listen and receive it. Now that's not to say that you don't vet criticism. Because God has given you a certain level of acumen and discernment and expertise in different areas of your life. And you can listen to different sources. But we shouldn't just stiff arm somebody away just because we don't want to hear it at all or we've just decided they're not a good source. I learned this lesson uh, quite strongly actually in my last church. I was over a ministry where we did The Life of Jesus. It was a two-hour production with song and dance and theater techniques. And I had a cast of over 300 volunteers who were helping make this thing come to life. And almost none of them had any experience within music, theater, or dance. But they all had opinions on how I should be making decisions and choices. And I have to tell you, God always used the most unlikely person. The person out of those 300 people with the least experience to come and speak absolute truth and life into me. And if I had not been willing to listen, if I had been too proud to rest on my own laurels, I would have missed growth personally, spiritually, but also for the sake of the entire ministry. Yeah, correction's hard. Discipline, it's hard. But if we can receive it with gentleness, we can benefit. Proverbs, again, the book of wisdom, it tells us whoever heeds correction is honored. Now, Proverbs also doesn't pull any punches. It also says he who hates correction is stupid. Whew, that stings, doesn't it? And correction does sting. The Bible speaks to that as well. It says, yeah, okay, discipline is hard. Hebrews tells us no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Don't you want that harvest of righteousness? So we've got to take a moment. We've got to pause. Some, maybe this morning, maybe this week, step back and look. Because we've all got blind spots. 
we've all got areas where few, if any, can speak into our lives because I am assured of my own knowledge within this subject. I need to ask myself, why am I so touchy? Why am I so angry when somebody offers constructive criticism? It's okay that it stings. I want to I let you off the hook a little bit here. Because your emotions are indicators. They're not dictators. What I mean by that is you merely experience your emotions as they pass you by. You can't control how you feel. But you can't control what you do with those feelings. And that's gentleness. Strength under control. Power under control. The fourth and last thing that, that sometimes causes friction, and I think we've all experienced this, sometimes we experience it on a weekly basis, it's when people let you down. It's when you've given your trust to somebody. It's when you've maybe set expectations that should be able to be met. You've given them a time frame. You've given them the tools that you need. You've encouraged them, and they let you down. Or you're a parent and you explain the rules of the house and your kids just keep going the other direction. Again, we have a choice. Do we dress them down? Do we attack? You dropped the ball. What are you doing? I trusted you with this. Or do we come alongside them and say, hey, we missed the mark here. What, what happened? How can I help? What is our response? What is our choice when people let us down? Because you and I both know that we let down Jesus every single day. And we know how he responds to us. Let's look at an example of how he has looked and helped us. Many of you know the story in John chapter 8 of the woman caught in adultery. The teachers of the law took this woman who was caught in adultery and brought her before Jesus. And they said to him, this woman was caught in adultery. The law says that we should stone her. What do you say? And Jesus, who is gentle, he just paused. And actually, he knelt down. And just starts writing in the sand. We don't know what he wrote. It's not important to the story. I'm curious. I'm going to ask him. And then he eventually he looks up and he says, whoever here is without sin, you throw the first stone. And then he goes back to writing in the sand. And eventually, one by one, starting with the oldest, presumably the wisest, they start walking away. And eventually Jesus looks up and he says, woman, is there no one here left to condemn you? And she said, no. And he said, then neither do See, what's important for us in this story to understand is that Jesus is the one with the power. Jesus was the one with the strength. The only one qualified to judge her. The only one qualified to actually pick up a stone. And instead, Jesus chose to protect her. He knew of her embarrassment and he shielded her. Now that is not to say that Jesus agreed with her choices. Because Jesus also said, go and sin no more. So Jesus was not without accountability, but he was gentle in his discipline. And Paul tells us that you and I are to do the same thing. In Romans chapter 15, he says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak. Gentleness. Gentleness is having the power to break something and instead choosing to mend it. That's what Jesus did with the woman. Now, he knew this was going to be hard for us, so he gave us a, a, like a Petri dish, a place for us to grow gentleness, a place for us to build, and it's actually within the home. And the Bible has verse after verse after verse on how we can nurture gentleness within the home. And husbands, you're the spiritual leaders of your family. He starts with you. He says, husbands, when you're speaking to your wives, do not be harsh. Be gentle in your language. Be gentle in your actions. Be gentle in how you interact with your wife. And wives are to be gentle and have a quiet spirit. Because in that inner beauty, 
you might even redeem a non-believing husband. And then wives and husbands, as you partner together as parents, when correcting children, it says, do not embitter your children. Be gentle. And then he flips the tables. Children, when you're receiving said instruction, obey your parents. This pleases the Lord. Gentleness can be given. Gentleness can be a response. We can see it in so many different ways. But peace in the home stems from being completely prouse, humble, and gentle. And do you see again how gentleness works in harmony with the fruit of the Spirit? See peace? They're always working in tandem. Now I know we live in a tourism town we will meet different people every day. There will be people that we perceive, and I'm, it's important that I want to use the word perceive. We perceive rude people. We perceive aggressive people. We perceive harsh people. They may not be intending it that way. So I want to, I want to give grace. I want to show goodwill towards others as we consider what it looks like to be gentle, because sometimes we're just miscommunicating. But every day we perceive rude people. We have a little bit of road rage going on. Somebody pulls out in front of us in season when there's a lot more traffic. They might communicate with a friendly hand gesture. They may shout outside their window. How do we respond? Well, Paul says it very simply in Philippians. He says, in humility, remember, prouse, consider others as more important than yourselves. That's hard. Going on, everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interests of others. If it helps, everyone is dealing with something. Everybody here today is dealing with something. You've got deadlines, you've got burdens, you've got personal issues, you've got grief. Gentleness demands that we step back, pause, put ourselves in their shoes, and try to understand what they're going through. And when in doubt... Do what the world over understands from Jesus' teaching in the Sermon on the Mount. It's the golden rule. We all know it. I could tell, you could tell it to me before I even put it on the screen. But treat people the same way you want them to treat you. It's gentleness. If I'm having a bad day and I'm a little harsh with you and my language is a little strong, do I want you to come back at me and rip into me? Or do I want you to go, hey, David... This isn't like you. What's going on in your life? How can I be praying for you? Earlier in that same Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the Beatitudes, which are essentially the attitudes that we need for a happy life. And he speaks directly to gentleness when he says, blessed are the meek, which you could also say, blessed are the gentle, or happy are the gentle, for they will inherit the earth. Now that same earth, the world, would tell us in this capitalistic society, go conquer, take, seek and destroy, do whatever you need to do to succeed. But the earth is not our model, Jesus is our model, and Jesus said, learn from me, I am gentle. Going back to the beginning of the message, men, I don't know about you, but Jesus is the kind of man that I want to be. And so the question is the same as it was at the beginning of this series. Are you willing? Are you willing? Gentleness is a choice. Are you willing to be gentle? And if so, you're going to need help. Are you connected to Jesus, the true vine? Are you committed to him seven days a week, 365? Because it's the only way that you can display gentleness that looks like his character. So this week, I want to encourage you with some action steps. If you're in town, you're in a hardware store, you're in a grocery, maybe you're in a restaurant, and someone serves you, try to be understanding, not demanding. When someone disagrees with you, make your point, not war. And when someone lets you down, when someone disappoints you, be gentle, not judgmental. Let me pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this 
profound verse. God, your, your entire word is so rich and has so much truth and so much instruction for godly living. But this one verse, this picture of what it looks like to embody the nature of your son is so incredibly powerful. And when we understand that because of your grace, the entire world can experience these things to some level, but you have called us to more. You have called us to greater. There is a greater expectation. God, would you help us to raise the bar, to raise the standard of what it is to exhibit love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, yes, gentleness, and self-control. God, we recognize that we cannot do it on our own. We need your help. So Jesus, true vine, nurture us, feed us through your spirit, continue to shape us into the image of you. Would you give us a, a mindfulness, an awareness, so that we can make better choices today and every day this week. May we focus on gentleness and just pause before we have that strong retort and say that age-old phrase, what would Jesus do? And God, as we do that, we pray that that will give us an opportunity not only to demonstrate your love, but to then speak your name, Jesus, so the gospel seeds might be spread and the truth might be multiplied. God, thank you for your word. We love you and praise you. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.